Welcome to World Lit with Shubhs. In today's video, we are going to see only one book because it's my favorite book, one of my favorite from the 2020 reading list. And uh, I thought that this book deserves a video on its own. There are a lot of stuff to talk about. I also wanted to keep the video short and uh, also give you a bit of a reading of the book so that you know what I'm talking about. The book that we are going to see today is Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. This book was published originally in Polish in 2009. This book was published in the wake of Tokarczuk's Man Booker Prize win. This book is an ecological murder mystery that talks about the relationship between man and animal, their struggle, their interdependence, etc. Tokarczuk was awarded Nobel Prize for Literature in 2018 and she received the prize in 2019. The book was originally published in Polish in 2009 and Antonio Lloyd-Jones, the translator, published it in 2018. Fitzgeraldo Editions is the publisher. One of the design decisions of Fitzgeraldo Editions is to not have a book cover art for any of their books. All their books are deep blue in color with just the name of the title and the title and the name of the author on the front cover. This is because in one of the interviews, Jacques Destin mentioned that it was only him and his part-timer who was working in Fitzgeraldo Editions and they didn't have the time or the resources to have a book cover art done. I don't know how this information is relevant or interesting for you, but I keep reading information like these all the time when I'm reading a book, so I think this is a good place to share my thoughts. The translator, Ms. Lloyd-Jones, has done a tremendous job. She's the primary translator of most of Bulga Tokarczuk's works. Uh, she's a big proponent of Polish literature into English. She's well known and well respected in the translator's community. Lloyd-Jones' translation is pitch perfect, creative and touching. The book's name is taken from William Blake's poetry collection, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. The 17th century poet, painter and printmaker. The title actually comes from one of his poems. That's why the word P-L-O-W is spelled with W and not U-G-H, like in modern English. Though he belonged to the romantics age of poetry, his writing was different from his contemporaries in the sense that he wrote about animals and uh, ethics and moral and stuff like that. Other references to William Blake in this book are like how William Blake had capitalized a few words in his poetry collection. Tokarczuk has also capitalized certain words in this book, uh, words such as animals, ailments, uh, being, night and stuff like that. Also one of the hobbies of the main character is to translate Blake's poetry from Polish to English. As you can see, Blake poetry has uh, an important role in this book. The book is set in an isolated Polish village on the Czech and Polish border. I would say the book is set in the early 2000s because it's a well-known fact that Olga Tokarczuk takes years to write a book and since the book was, was published in 2009, I think she must have written it in the early 2000s. It is written from the perspective of an older woman called Janaina Tusheko. I think that's how we pronounce her name. She's a recluse. Uh, she's a village eccentric who is interested in astrology, animal rights and stuff like that. She makes ends meet by taking care of uh, the cottages in her hamlet uh, during winter when the owners of the cottages move to warmer places to escape the harsh Polish winter. She is portrayed as a strong woman. The fact that she's physically strong and she can do a man's job in the society adds to the eccentricity. Even otherwise, Janaina is full of eccentricities and quirks. For example, she doesn't like names of people. Uh, she doesn't like her own name. She rarely ever mentions her name in the book. Uh, she gives nicknames to all the people she knows in the village. She doesn't call them by their original names. For example, her neighbor is called Oddball. Another neighbor who dies in the book, in the first few pages of the book, is called Bigfoot. She has several ailments throughout the story, throughout her life which are not actually explained much in the book, like what the ailments are and what she's ailing from. But she does uh, get admitted in the hospital for a week and because of this she can't move around for a month. So she has these mysterious ailments. She knows the day and time of her death based on the position of the constellation of stars and planets, uh, the time of her birth. She could determine when she would die. Everybody looks at her weirdly because of her quirks and 
eccentricities. So the story goes like this. Oddball wakes her up in the middle of the night to take her to Bigfoot's cottage because Bigfoot is dead. He dies accidentally choking on a deer uh, bone. However, as the story progresses, as we see that one by one, the villagers fall dead. The, those who harm the animals. Janaina has a theory. Uh, she says that animals have gone on war and they are taking revenge on the humans that are hurting them. <laughs> this kind of reminded me of a lot of the rings. Entmoot and the trees going on war against Sauron. Even her friends Oddball and Dizzy are skeptical of her. As it is, the police don't have a favorable opinion of her and they think that she's gone batshit crazy. And so the rest of the story is about how this mystery is unraveled. I think it was like the book was not written as a murder mystery but somehow in the end it just became a murder mystery and uh, because it's not a murder mystery in the traditional sense it's a very uh, it, it's not I, I wouldn't call it like Miss Marple's kind of a book or anything because she's not the one who is going and figuring out who the killer is and stuff like that this book is more like a deep thought and uh, the rumination of things that are important to an eccentric like Janaina. She's a vegetarian, she is an animals activist, so she believes in astrology and even though these tropes are something that are weird to most of the world, the story kind of sucks you in and you kind of start thinking about what Janaina is saying or how she is feeling about certain topics. So basically there are so many tropes that encourage the reader to think for themselves about what they think about how Janaina feels about a certain thing. There have been so many instances in the book when I had to put the book down and think about what I thought about how old women are treated in a society, how they become invisible, things about poetry, things about translation, things about hunting, things about vegetarianism. And of course there is a moral question at the end of the book because the ending itself is a, a questionable ethical ending. So you get to think a lot. Though the book appears heavy on so many controversial themes, the book is fairly accessible despite being a Nobel laureate's work. I've always had trouble reading Nobel laureate's work because I always feel that they go over my head, that I don't understand what they're talking about. But this book is surprisingly so accessible and so funny. Not the laugh out loud kind of funny, but more like smirking and self-deprecating humor and stuff like that. Janaina has her own idiosyncrasies and I really love her for that, for being a different person. The writing is dreamy, Grimm Brothers fairy tale-ish and I don't know how to say that because I find East European writing extremely dreamy and uh, folklorish and uh, I always feel that it takes the reader to a different world. Now I would like to read a few passages from the book somewhere from the middle but it doesn't have any spoilers. It's good to sit in Good News' shop. It's the coziest place in town. Mothers with children meet up here and old ladies on their way to lunch at the pensioners' canteen. The car park security guard and frozen saleswomen from the vegetable market come here. Everyone is given something hot to drink. One could say that Good News runs a cafe here. Today I was to wait for her to lock up the sanctuary and then we'd be off to the Czech Republic with Dizzy to visit the bookshop that sells Blake. Good News was folding some bandanas. She never said much, and if she did speak, she said it quietly. So you had to listen to her very carefully. The last few customers were still browsing the clothes rails in search of a bargain. I stretched out on a chair and closed my eyes blissfully. Have you heard about the foxes that have been seen out on the plateau near where you live? Fluffy white foxes? I froze. Near where I live? I opened my eyes and saw the gentleman with the poodle. Apparently that rich fellow with a funny name released some from his farm, he said, standing in front of me with several pairs of trousers slung over his arm. His poodle was looking at me, a doggy smile on its face. It clearly recognized me. Innad? I asked. That's the one, confirmed the man, and then addressed good news. Would you please find me some trousers with an 80 centimeter waist? Then at once he went back to his story. They can't locate the man, he's gone missing, vanished without trace, like a needle in a haystack. 
the old gentleman went on. He's probably run away with his lover to a warmer country. And as he was rich, he'll find it easy to hide. Apparently, he was mixed up in some sort of a racket. A young man with a shaved head who had been asking about Nike or Puma tracksuits and now was rummaging among the clothes rails responded, it wasn't a racket, it was the mafia, he said, hardly opening his mouth at all. They were importing furs illegally from Russia, using his farm as a cover. He hadn't settled up with the Russian mafia, so he got scared and did a runner. I found this topic alarming. I was starting to feel afraid. So, is your poodle a dog or a bitch? I politely asked the gentleman in a desperate attempt to divert the conversation onto less sinister tracks. My Maxi? He's a boy, of course. Still a bachelor, he said laughing. But he was clearly more interested in the local gossip because he turned to the skinhead and continued, he was very wealthy. He had a hotel on the main road out of Kotsko, a delicate sen, a fox farm, a slaughterhouse and meat processing plant, a stud farm. But how much more there was in his wife's name? Here's a size 80 for you, I said, handing him a pretty good pair of grey trousers. He examined them carefully and put on his glasses to read the laundry label. Oh yes, I like these. I ta- I'll take them. You know what? I like the things that are trim, nice and close fitting. They emphasize the figure. Well, sir, how different people can be. I always buy everything too big. It gives me freedom, I said. Dizzy had received some encouraging news. The local weekly, the Kotsko Gazette, had offered to publish his translations of Blake in its poetry corner. He was excited and intimidated all at once. We drove among the almost deserted highway towards the border. First, I'd like to read his letters and only then go back to the poetry. But if they are asking for poetry, my God, what can I give them? What shall we give them first? To tell the truth, I couldn't concentrate on Blake anymore. I saw that we were passing the shabby buildings at the border crossing and entering the Czech Republic. The road here was better and Dizzy's car stopped rattling. Dizzy, is it true about those foxes? Good News asked him from the back seat. That they escaped from Innard's farm and are going about the forest? Dizzy confirmed that it was. It happened a few days ago. At first, the police thought he had sold all the animals to someone before disappearing. But it looks as if he let them go. Strange, isn't it? Are they searching for him? I asked. Dizzy replied that no one had reported him missing, so there was no reason to look for him. His wife hadn't come forward, nor had his children. Maybe he had given himself a holiday. His his wife claimed it wasn't the first time it had happened. Once he had vanished for a week and then call from the Dominican Republic. Until the banks were after him, there was no reason for alarm. A man's free to do what he wants with his life until he falls foul of the banks, Dizzy sermonized with contagious certainty. I think he'd make a superb press spokesperson for the police. Dizzy also said the police were trying to establish the source of the money that the commandant had under his trouser belt. It was a bribe. By now, they were sure he had been on his way back from meeting with Innard. It takes the police a long time to establish things that seem obvious. And that's another thing, he said finally. The weapon that must have been used to kill the commandant had traces of animal blood on it. In conclusion, Tokarchuk's book is wise and funny and controversial and thought-provoking and beautifully written and beautifully translated. It is a quiet wonder. I wanted to keep the length of the video under 10 or 12 minutes. I don't think that's going to happen with this book. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, let me know what you thought. Have you read this book? If you haven't read this book, I would strongly recommend that you pick it up and read it. If you are into women's writers, I mostly read women's writers. so You should subscribe to my channel. See you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.